Now, phase two, this is getting rid of the hydroxylated derivatives. So phase one was about adding an OH to make it more water soluble. Now we've got to conjugate it or link it to something else to be able to pass it out through the liver into the bile or through the urine. And there's a number of compounds that do this. The amino, the uh, uh, peptide, tripeptide glutathione does this. Glucuronic acid does this. Sulfate or sulfur does this. Acetyl-CoA does this, acetylation. SAM, which is the universal methylator, so this is methylation. And then a number of amino acids like taurine, cysteine, glycine can also act as detoxifiers. But the major detoxifiers of phase two is glut glutathione, glucuronic acid, sulfation, and acetylation. Those are the four biggies. Usually the problems are in one of those. So knowing which foods can stimulate these and which nutrients can stimulate gives you the answer to be able to go through phase two. So this makes the derivatives more water soluble. We may use glutathione. And let's have a look at glutathione. It's made from glutamic acid, glycine and cysteine, the three amino acids. And it recycles. You often purchase, or people purchase, reduced glutathione, which is what we manufacture. Reduced glutathione takes a, uh, uh, a free radical and becomes oxidized and then recycles it. And this enzyme that recycles glutathione, continuing to help us detoxify, is called glutathione peroxidase. And this is one of the three enzymes in the body that uses selenium. I think we're going to talk about selenium briefly later on, aren't we? Okay. So there's three enzymes in the body that use selenium as a cofactor. So glutathione peroxidase is one of those. Now, to stimulate glutathione, you need zinc. And N-acetylcysteine is quite good at stimulating it. But look at the foods. Spinach, onions, garlic, broccoli, lemongrass, celery, and watercress. If you can make a soup or a dish of those, help. Not difficult, is it, when you look at those and you think, oh, yeah, I could incorporate that in and put that into my diet and test the person for zinc. So those would be the foods which you could bring in. Rosemary, very nice herb, very rich in iodine uh, and a great detoxifier there. Garlic, broccoli, remember, careful with the broccoli with red type, spinach and onion. Um, so glutathione, a lot of drugs are metabolized by glutathione. Um, so let's just go back there. So um, glutathione conjugates are further metabolized before excretion. The glutamic acid and glycine groups are removed, and an acetyl group donated from acetyl-CoA is added to the cysteine. And what this does, it makes a substance in the body, a natural substance in the body, called N-acetylcysteine, or otherwise known as NAC for short, NAC, N-acetylcysteine. And this locks on or conjugates with the toxin right, and allows you to pass it out in the urine. N-acetylcysteine is a perfectly natural substance in the body. Okay, You don't find it in foods. Okay, So you can't eat N-acetyl foods, even though they may be a sulfur-bearing uh, foods. You actually make it inside the body. It is thus an excellent supplement to be used to activate the glutathione pathway. Now, it's a beautiful substance because it has many detoxifying properties. It acts to activate glutathione, which is the main pathway of most drugs. It, the acetyl part here stimulates acetylation, which means it has an acetyl group which helps people with acetylation problems. The cysteine is a sulfur-bearing amino acid, so it stimulates sulfation. And the cysteine itself is an amino acid which can bond straight onto the toxin as well and pass out. So there's four ways that N-acetylcysteine works. So it's a wonderful detoxifier. So if you get into trouble with a chemical toxin, you've eaten something that you shouldn't have, you've reacted to something, and one of the things that people react to um, much more commonly than anything else is anesthetics. A lot of people will tell you they cannot get over an anesthetic for days or sometimes weeks. If it's a general, it could be weeks. If it's a dental one, a local one, it could be days and days and days. N-acetylcysteine is the answer to these people. When you wake up from an operation, if it's elected or not, and you've had your tubes taken out and you're ready to swallow something, that's the time when you take your N-acetylcysteine because it gets into the system it sulfates, it glutathione, it gets rid of the anaesthetic, and it'll clear you out you know, very quickly. You'll come out of that. Right? 
do not take it before the operation. <laughs> okay? Because I've had patients in the past who I've forgotten to tell them when to take it. Do not take it before the operation because they wake up. You know all about that, don't you, with patients waking up during operation. Right, okay, so you take it afterwards. So it is a great detoxifier because of the cysteine component here. Sulfur, remember, has two, four, and six you know, valencies that can bond on to toxic metals. It's a great chelator of toxic metals. So n cysteine can be used for uh, mercury toxicity, almost any metal toxicity, but particularly if you've had amalgams done and you swallowed a bit of mercury and you haven't been to a holistic dentist who does the job properly, and you think, well, I might have inhaled some mercury vapor and things, N-acetylcysteine is the answer. Always give N-acetylcysteine for you know, problems like that, acute chemical toxicity, acute toxic metals. Or it's the one of the foundation uh, ingredients in nutrient phase one and two. So nutrient phase one and two, um, that compound, as I say, which is good. This is why we give it to dentists, or dentists buy it more than anything else, because they prescribe it for their patients or for themselves, because they're exposed to these vapors all the time. Even when they got masks on, that mercury vapor is everywhere in a, in a treatment room, in a dental surgery. Okay, now it has one other good property which we'll just talk about. Um, <laughs> it's a mucolytic. It breaks up mucus. So this may be something which you might want to prescribe for somebody who appears to have an asthmatic type symptom. <gasps> they've got a lot of mucus in the lungs. Okay, they've got a lot of mucus there. And very often you get this after an infection. So they could have had influenza and they're left coughing and spluttering after for a long time afterwards. They got this post-infection, post-influenza type of cough. That's the boy to get it out, okay? It breaks up the mucus. It's a mucolytic. It breaks mucus up so the person can pass it. So solid mucus will get broken up into smaller components. So that's a good, useful thing. And because it gets rid of the toxins, it will get rid of endotoxins from the virus. So sometimes people are left with a post-viral cough. And he said, well, why are you coughing? I don't know. I just can't stop it. You know, when you cough, you cough, don't you? I was talking to somebody uh, during the week. She said, um, she said, it's terrible. She said, I went to the theater last night and this cough started. <laughs> and uh, have you ever experienced this when you've been to somewhere where you mustn't cough, but you do? <laughs> and you haven't got your glass of water by the side of it. <laughs> you know, if you s just sip water, it's okay. But you cough and then the more worried about it you get, the more you cough again. You don't want to get up and disturb, particularly in the theatre and things. So um, N-acetylcysteine is good for that post-infectious type of cough, post-viral type of cough, which people get left with, or excess mucus. So think about it as detoxifying metals, and think about it as a detoxifying chemical. Um, wonderful substance, but you don't want to take it on a long-term basis. It's not a long-term therapy. And because as it chelates out mercury, it will chelate out also zinc and copper. So if you were to take it for long periods of time, you'd actually deplete the other metals as well, the good ones. So you, you, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, like a, a medication, if you like. It's using nutrition for medical purposes. So if you take it for a week, two weeks, even a month is fine. But on a long-term basis, it's not the sort of thing you take, you know, because it will chelate out other, other metals in, in the long term. But in the short term, it's fine. Glucuronidation is a glucuronic acid. This is very rich in artichokes. This is a natural best source of glucuronic acid is actually artichokes. A lot of um, hormones, neurotransmitters are um, detoxified this way. So we've got artichokes, cashew nuts, soy, licorice, flax, and alfalfa. These are the common foods that contain glucuronic acid. Sulfation uses PAPs, or active form of sulfur called phosphoadenosyl phosphosulfate or PIAPs, um, but sulfates are most commonly found in cysteine, the amino acid cysteine, and alpha-lipoic acid foods and things. And MSM, you know, many of you come across MSM, methyl sulfonylmethane, um, which is a good um, uh, support for the joints for chondroitin sulfate and glucosamine sulfate for arthritis. So many neurotransmitters are broken down or detoxified by sulfur, and of course the natural foods are the, uh, the broccolis and the sprouts, the cruciferous vegetables, asparagus. Um, so hands up in the room, how many people smell sulfur 
after they've eaten asparagus. See? Okay, now hands up the number of people who don't smell sulfur. And what you come to, there's more people who smell sulfur than don't, and the rest don't eat asparagus. We come to the conclusion. So those who don't know, the no voters <laughs> there, are people who don't eat asparagus. <laughs> Can you believe there are people who don't eat asparagus? No. Okay. So the question is, if you smell sulfur, is it good or bad? It's the genetic inability to hold onto the sulfur, but does that mean that you can't sulfate properly? In other words, you're getting rid of sulfur instead of using the sulfur in the body. So those people who didn't smell it might be actually better because they're holding on to the sulfur. It's a difficult question to answer. Nobody's been able to actually answer that one. It's like they found years ago, something like two-thirds of the population show pesticides in their urine, which alarmed the bodies enormously that actually, you know, these pesticide problems are bigger than what we imagine, the number of pesticides, the poisons that are getting in the body. But the two-thirds of the people is not the problem. It's the one-third who don't show it. What are they doing with the pesticides? In other words, they're storing them and they have the inability to detoxify. So if you see it in the urine, it's probably quite good because it means you're passing it out, but it's probably done its job and conjugated with something. So my feeling is I'd rather smell it than not smell it. See? But it's interesting because it's only asparagus that seems to do it, isn't it? So more than any other. So broccoli, asparagus, garlic, very sulfur, wonderful detoxifier. Mustard, dill, parsnip, horseradish, cabbage, yeah, that's got a distinct sulfury smell as well, isn't it? And stinging nettle. I was, my mother used to get stinging nettles and hide them in the drains <laughs> for us. We spotted them though. <laughs> and in those days, we had a dining room carpet, not fixed carpet anyway, and that could go nicely under the carpet there. <laughs> I just dropped my serviette, mum, <laughs> and put it under there. And years later, when they changed the carpet round as they did, you see these dried out leaves underneath the carpet there. But even the dog, the dog was the greatest, of course, vacuum cleaner around for kids who don't want to eat something, is you just drop it in front of the dog. But no dog will eat stinging nettles, unfortunately. No. Okay. So this is the sulfur pathway. We make sulfur from cysteine to make sulfate, which goes on to make, uh, sort of, sorry, sulfite. So cysteine makes sulfite, which goes on to make sulfate. And then this, adds to with ATP, the phosphate, to make phosphoadenosyl phosphosulfate, which otherwise better known as PAPS, which goes on in turn to make sulfation in making myelin and detoxification. It goes on to make collagen in our discs, etc. But this little pathway is interesting because it's called sulfite oxidase. Now, it's an oxidase pathway. You'll see it's an ase. It's in italics, so it's an enzyme, sulfite oxidase which means it oxidizes and adds an oxygen onto SO3 to make SO4. Now, SO3 is sulfite, and this has antifungal properties. So they add sulfites to wine when it's coming towards the end of fermentation to stop the fermentation. It's usually used as sodium or potassium metabisulfite. Now, that's left in the wine because it stops the wine from fermenting, and when wine is due to be exported, you don't want it to be fermenting because it will blow the corks off or go off. And this is why some people can't, don't, you know, remove sulfites, they get blinding headaches with it. So they find if they drink wine or beer, uh, they get an awful headache, and it's awful. You know, some people are genetically like this, and they need to take nutrients which can boost up the sulfite oxidase pathway. So, and then they can usually tolerate it. But these are people who can't tolerate more than, you know, if at all, wine or beer, but they can have as much gin and tonic as they want, or cognac or whiskey, because yeah? they haven't got the sulfates. It's not a fermented, that's distilled. So it's fermented goods will produce sulfites there. And you'll see that the cofactor here for this enzyme is molybdenum. This is a trace mineral uh, which is present richest in beans, and particularly lima beans. Lima beans are the most common. So if you have lima beans or beans with your dinner and a glass of wine, you may be able to stimulate that enzyme a bit. But these are people who can't tolerate beers and wines. So the question is, can you buy sulfite-free wines? No. Because grapes naturally have sulfites in them, regardless of the adding. But you can get low-sulfite ones where they don't add extra ones. So after this particular 
session, Jill will tell you where you can buy those. Okay? Um, so you can buy low sulfite ones and those where the wines don't have sulfites added to stop the fermentation. The frustrating thing is when you go to wh the country where they manufacture the wines, when they grow them and, and bring them up, like Italy and France and Spain, you can drink all the wine over there. And you can drink cheap Blanc over there and feel fine. You touch any of that wine over here and you get a thumping headache, okay? Because they add it for the export, for the traveling. So it doesn't travel, you see. So they add the metabi sulfate and a little bit more because it's coming to Britain. <laughs> so if they don't like the British, they put an extra spoon in there, I think. Okay. Right, so chemicals composed, conjugated by sulfur, acetone, DDT, ooh, uh, ethylene glycol, it's dry, um, uh, antifreeze, fluoride or fluorine, toluene, and triethylene chloride, which is dry cleaning fluid. Okay, those can be deadly substances for people who can't detoxify. Now, the fourth way is acetylation, uses acetyl-CoA. Now, acetyl-CoA is something made in the Krebs cycle, in the, in the process of making energy between glycolysis and the Krebs cycle. We make acetyl-CoA. Um, the reactions are catalyzed by acetyl transferase enzymes, which are naturally um, stimulated by endive, peas, cucumber, watercress, and tomatoes. The drug isocyanide, which is used in treatment of TB, is the classic sort of conjugator and the marker that they use for acetylation defects. And these are the people who tolerate or can't tolerate petroleum smells. They can't go into garages and fill up. You know, they, they, they just feel very strange. And uh, newsprint, so they open the newspaper up and then the then this eyes begin to sting. Sam, you know all about that. And tells, particularly Sam's favorite is color magazines with the Sunday newspaper, isn't it? So color magazines are, have more of these chemicals in the print because the ink is, is color and it's very... And I could never find that, you know, on Sunday evenings, you know, it's quite nice just to sit down occasionally and read a paper. You know, I don't often read a paper. But I only do the paper there and read that and there. And sometimes I'll glance at color supplement. And by the time dinner comes, you know, the eyes are stinging like mad. I'm, you know, squeezing the eyes like that and think, oh, have I eaten or drunk? Because it's coming out in the eyes. It's not something inside that's coming out. It's the smell, the aroma, the chemicals from the print. And acetylation is my problem, okay? Because I'm low in acetylcholine. Therefore, you know already now what my definitive meridian is, don't you? Okay, because it's low acetylcholine. So newsprints and hypochlorite. Hypochlorite is that substance we talked about earlier, which um, is made from hydrogen peroxide by myeloperoxid. So that's household bleach, which we need to be able to detoxify if we've got too much of. Now, the last sort of common ones here are methylation, which is catalyzed by a variety of methyl transferase using S-adenosyl methionine. Uh, many hormones are methylated and conjugated. Uh, here we see the process, oh, that's clever, isn't it? of making methyl groups from methionine to S-adenosyl methionine to cysteine. Uh, to homocysteine, then on to cysteine here. So we spend time talking about homocysteine at time to time, and I think we're going to cover that this afternoon in the, uh, when we look at the starter kit with homocysteine and the problems that that can produce. So here we see the uh, methylation process going on. Now, on the right-hand side, in the liver only, we can see the breakdown of choline um, to betaine to dimethylglycine to sarcosine with a methyl group being given off at each of these enzymic reactions. So that's a secondary way that we produce methyl groups. So we can produce it from the vitamin B3 choline to betaine to dimethylglycine also. But that pathway only works in the liver. And lastly, you can conjugate with taurine, glycine, cysteine, etc. An um, example is sodium benzoate, which is a food preserver, is conjugated primarily by glycine and we use sodium benzoate as the marker for <coughs> glycine defect. So there we see each of the phase two conjugators and what nutrients you might suggest as possibilities and foods for each of the pathways where there's a blockage. So um, now what we really want is a substance which can stimulate phase one and phase two, isn't it? Now there is one, well there's probably quite a number of these substances, but the one that's got most press 
and particularly in more recent times, more than anything else, is turmeric. Turmeric is a wonderful stimulator of phase one and phase two. Now, we talked in previous modules about turmeric. Wonderful antioxidant, so it has the property of protecting us from that superoxide which we produce in phase one, and it stimulates the phase two enzymes universally. So you detoxify much better, so it's a detoxifier. I think a lot of spices detoxify. One of the reasons spices work, or there's many reasons why they do, is they stimulate the cytochrome P450s. They literally spice us up. This is what the way they're called spices. They spice you up, which increases your detoxification. Some of them are heating spices. So some of them will actually warm you up, like ginger and cinnamon, and they increase your metabolic rate. So we activate certain enzymes, like myeloperoxidase, when we've got an infection. If you try taking ginger, ginger tincture, you've got an infection, you'll start to get really hot within about 20 minutes or so, particularly the tincture, and that's great because you're upregulating your detox, your, the production of uh, myeloperoxidase, and then you'll kill your virus and your bacteria off much quicker that way. So turmeric is a great one, and what we found that turmeric, the problem with turmeric is nine-tenths of it is not absorbed. It's great for clearing out the gut and things, but to actually get turmeric and the turbarones and the curcuminins, which are the active bioflavonoids in there, to work in the body, you've got to absorb them. And they first of all, they looked at piperin, which is a pepper, black pepper extract for it. And then they looked at boswellia or frankincense to do this. But undoubtedly, the best one, on, on as far as our testing is concerned, and you know, with the feedback on this, is black cumin seed or nigella, as it's called, which is equally a, a spice. And nigella is something which um, is a big Middle Eastern spice, uh, grown anywhere around the Middle Eastern area. And if you have some nigella seeds and you chew them in your mouth, they're like poppy seeds, very tasteful, <gasps> you think you've eaten pepper, and it's very similar. It, maybe it's got piperin and other substances in it. Um, but it absorbs, it aids the absorption of the active ingredients in the turmeric. So we found it halves the dose that a person requires. So when a person muscle tests, let's say to, let's say for argument's sake, to six capsules of turmeric, as for you know their antioxidant properties and things on an ongoing basis, they will only strengthen, they only need three, if it's 50% black cumin seed and 50% turmeric. So it halves the amount, because it, the other half gets in much quicker. So we do a 50-50 mix, what we call smart turmeric, and it's one of, uh, I think, one of our best sellers, isn't it now, Jane? You're turning it out like, like there's no tomorrow. Um, but it's a really wonderful thing, not only to take, but actually to put into culinary. I, I usually, you know, more often undo mine and put it into cooking and things. I love it in mayonnaise. You can put it into mayonnaise, you can put it into the cooking, into the you know, stews or casseroles or anything like that. So it's a very pleasant way of uh, taking the spice. So. That will conclude the first introduction to um, detoxification phase one and phase two.